Hi, everybody. Welcome back. My name is Lisa Jarrett, and I am one of the co-founders and co-directors of KS MOCA, the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. School Museum of Contemporary Art. Um, I'm joined today by my colleague, co-founder and co-director Harold Fletcher and Amanda Lee Evans, who is one of our primary collaborators, um, along with a very special guest, uh, the artist Lucia Mohe, and the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. student Mo, who is in the third grade and will be helping us introduce the artist today. Um, before we start, I want to give a warm welcome to all of the Dr. MLK Jr. School students that are joining us on the YouTube live stream. And I want to offer deep thanks and gratitude to the folks at Dr. MLK Jr. School that help us bring this all together, including Principal Jill Sage, Nancy Rios, Michelle Peake, and Paige Thomas. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mo. Welcome, Mo. Hi, I am Mo, and I'll be introducing Lucia Mohe. Lucia Mohe is a Peruvian artist who works, focuses on interspecies relationships. Some of her recent projects include adapting and re-performing Darwin's. Darwin's experiments. My Core meditation, rituals, rituals and underpants, urban. urban tree pits, and the fungi broadcast broadcast about perform deforestation. deforestation in Peru. For the past ten years, she has organized. Plantan Moville, a yearly walking forest performance. Mo, I think we lost your audio for just a second there. Mohe. Mohe has shown her work internationally internationally thank you so much mo we really appreciate that you did a great job and lucia a warm welcome to you and um, the lovely teo and we will uh, turn it over to you thanks so much for being with us thank you thank you for the invitation thank you mo for the introduction and welcome Dr. MLK Junior School students. I'm very excited to be here talking to you, even though I can't see you, but I look forward to seeing you, um, meeting you hopefully sometime soon. I'm joined here today with Teo. This is my son, he's five weeks old and he has nowhere else to be. So he'll be joining us today. So I'll be bouncing a little bit to prevent um, some crying. Um, so I'll start sharing my screen. I've prepared some images to show you a little bit about my work. I've, that is not where we start. So we'll try again. There we go. So that's my name, Lucia Monge. And I'm a Peruvian artist, like Mo said. I came from Lima and now live in Portland. And I am an artist and my work is a way of answering questions. So I think questions are a very important part of the way I start projects. And I was thinking that I wanted to present to you my work in around these questions because I think children are the best question askers. I think you ask the best questions, the most fun, the most serious, the most important questions are usually asked by students. So, and questions also fuel my art practice. So I'll start with the first question. And I, this question is, what if our attitudes could shape our bodies? The way we think or behave with others could have an impact on our bodies. So I started making some sculptures around with this question. This sculpture is a sculpture um, of a cross section of a thumb. And the thumb is supposed to be the finger that separates us from the rest of the animals. So in theory, makes us more important than the other animals. So I was thinking, okay, what did we do with this finger that makes us so special? We actually made a lot of plastic. So this finger is a representation. It's all made out of plastic. What if the plastic went all the way through and our fingers became the plastic that we need? 
Now, this image is a, a neuron. Um, this sculpture is the same idea. I'm thinking, okay, humans think they're so smart, but some of the things that we do are not that smart. And in Peru, we say, oh, you're, when we want to tell, when, when, you, when we want to say that someone is not that smart, we say, oh, your neuron is getting lonely in there because it's the only one. So this is a lonely neuron and it had a light that would uh, turn on and turn off like intermittently. And in this case, um, these are three bones that are massive, they're big, they're the size of a whole room and they are made out of soil and of moss. And it's the same idea. These three sculptures are, are a way for me to, to think and ask how um, humans think they're so special, but maybe the things that we do are not showing how special we are or how considerate we are with the rest. So even though we think we have big egos and we might think of ourselves as huge species, in the end, we're all made out of soil and we'll end up um, being together, part of the land. Now, this is my grandfather, and my grandfather, his nickname was Choclo, which means corn in Spanish. And um, his nickname was Choclo because when he was little, he had like corn hair. And I think Teo has some of his hair, you probably don't see it, but he has corn hair too. Anyway, Choclo, my grandfather, was a scientist. And you see him here with some um, rats. And I show his picture because I mentioned I'm interested in asking questions with my art practice. I'm also interested in collaborating. I think that a great part of, of being an artist can be working with others. And in some cases, others who do things that are very different from what I do, for example, science. So I like collaborating with science and I like the way that science and arts have many things in common. One of the things in common, I think, is asking these questions and being able to um, make or invent experiments that can help us as, answer those questions. So in my art practice, um, a lot of the questions that I ask are around my relationship with plants and how people have different relationships to plants. So the same way that Choclo was kind of touching or seeing a connection or, or reaching forward to these animals, I am doing the same thing with plants over and over again. The next question I will share then is, what if plants taught us about water? What if we could say, okay, plants, you're gonna be the teachers on how to conserve, how to keep water and how to use water more smartly, more smartly? smarter, in a smarter way. So um, I come from Lima, like I mentioned, and Lima is a desert. So it's very, water is very important to us. And we're very aware when we have water, when we don't have water. And a lot of the, um, a lot of the times, the first answer is how do we keep water? How do we conserve water? We use less water. So if we had a cup, maybe we should be using a smaller cup. Or if we have a bottle, maybe it should be a smaller bottle. But I wanted to ask plants how they did it. What else can we do other than use less? How can we be more efficient? So I started looking into plants that live in the desert and that are especially, they're specific to the desert. And in this case, I'll show you some plants that are from the desert in South Africa, the Namakwaland Desert. So I was, I was there um, working with some students in the university. Okay, it will bounce harder. So some of these plants, the way that the shapes these plants have help them capture water. For example, if you see this picture, there are like little hairs on the plant and these are microscope images. So we wouldn't see them if we look at them just straight with our eyes. But if we look closer, they have these hairs that help catch all the, um, the fog that's in the air. So the plant can kind of like comb the par water particles in the air and catch them and water itself. This is a, um, a part of a plant from Lima, from South America, and it's doing the same thing. The spines on one hand are protecting the water that the plant has, yeah. and on the other hand, the fluffy sponge part over there is helping collect the water from the air. Um, 
So I was looking at all these shapes in all these plants and all the ways that they collect water. In this case, this one has some beads, um, some round parts, kind of like pimples. And the pimples help, again, also collect the water from the air and slide it into the side and then collect it all the way. It funnels all the way down to the base of the plant where it can uh, water itself. We have to remember that there's no rain like Portland here, where plants can just sit there with their big leaves and just receive it all. So yeah, right, Mo? So these plants have to be very, very smart in how do they collect this water. So after looking at these plants and their strategies, I decided, OK, I'm going to bring some of those shapes and make the cups, the bottles, the jars, the pitchers that I was um, thinking about at the beginning, the common things that people might use for uh, dealing with water. Here is a pitcher. And it's using some of those shapes that we saw in the plants, but it's rethinking what a pitcher or a jar can look like if it's conserving water. And this is a cup. This is a cup that is also a fog catching cup. So this cup, you could, um, the way that the angles that it has, the pimples or the beads that it has, the bottle at the bottom, everything that it has. Um, I was thinking you could wear it in your head and, and be catching water as you walk around. It has a little um, straw that you could put around on your mouth. So what if we really needed, what if this could be our cup? Now I'm gonna share another question that I had. So one day I was thinking, okay, what if we could shake hands like leaves? Have you ever seen how leaves in the um, wind do a little shaking thing i was like oh maybe it's an, an introduction okay we'll bounce harder so what if we could shake hands like leaves what if we could move like leaves like plants so i'm going to show you a little bit of a video i think a lot about how plants move because we don't normally see them moving and i think that's very interesting <laughs> yeah i think it's very interesting because i think it changes our relationship when we look at an animal the animal wags the tail, greets us, and we have a different relationship. But when we look at a plant, we have to look closer because we don't necessarily see it moving. So the first way I answered this question, or one of the ways that I've answered this question is, I thought, okay, what if we put shoes on tree branches that I find, would that help us see them more like mobile? Would that help us imagine them as beings that are walking around? Um, so I went to the streets and collected all the tree branches that were fallen. In this case, it, I was in, living in Providence, Rhode Island. There's a time of the year where it's, where it's very windy. So a lot of branches fall on the, um, on the street. And then I got secondhand shoes and connected them together. And I tried to balance these branches so that they could stand again on these shoes. And I've done this work also with other people. I've invited people to bring a pair of shoes and then together we help these trees stand. Sometimes I also try to use um, technology, less times but sometimes it's happened. How can I measure the way that trees are moving because we don't necessarily see them. In this case I collaborated with another artist and we tried to make a Fitbit. Do you know like a Fitbit that trackers, the activity trackers that some people use? So this is an activity tracker for a tree, which is kind of works, but kind of doesn't work because the, at least the branch is the, the least part that is going to move. Um, but then we tried it on, on, not on the branch, on the leaves. So a lot of these are just experiments to see what if, what could happen. Um, some of them work, some of them don't, and it's fine because it's part of the process. Um, in that project, what I did is, what I'm showing you now is a um, drawing of the street where I used to live in Providence. Each one of those dots is a tree on the street. So I would go on different streets and I would make a note of where each tree was and the size of the dot is indicating how big or how small that tree is. And I would take a picture of that tree and then just draw the, um, the um, silhouette of that tree. And then when I turned it around, like the image on the right, 
it kind of <laughs> looked like a moving figure again, similar to the um, sculptures that I showed before. So then I changed, I put all these silhouettes in the same street on each one of the streets. And instead of having a letter size page with the little dots, I had these big drawings that were the size of, the, <laughs> of our room with these, um, what I think are kind of dance positions. So I think of these as scores for a dancer where a person could make, a, um, where each tree is a stop motion or, or a still in a fluid movement of um, tree gestures. So this is um, a short stop motion, but ideally um, next time I can show you a video of a person uh, doing these, these movements, these dances. And something that was important to me was to think about how um, in this case, the, it is the, the group of trees that gives the movement. Because sometimes we think of movement in an individual, in a single person. But I think it's also important and interesting to think of move, the movement that is created a collective. Yes. So um, another way that I've had of answering these questions, what if we could see plant movement, what if we could understand plant movement different, is something that Mo brought up. Mo mentioned that I reperformed uh, Darwin's experiments. And again, the, the science interest comes here. Um, Darwin, Charles Darwin is a scientist uh, from England for many, many years ago. And he had these uh, studies, these experiments, where he would uh, make notations, make marks of the tree of plant parts to see how they moved across the whole day. And something that's very important is that the movement wasn't because of the light, but it was because the plants wanted to climb. So they did these rotations until they found something to attach on and then they grabbed and then they could climb um, and move forward. So to do these experiments in my own way today as Lucia Monge instead of Charles Darwin, I invented my tools and I designed my experiment again. So here you're seeing my eye patch that I made so I could look better and make my measurements more precise. And here you can see on the left the, um, the contraption or the box that I made. It has three sides of windows. So I could look at the plant from three different sides. And like you see on the picture of the right, make markings of where these uh, plant parts were. In this case, it's a tendril, which is, if you've ever seen um, a grape plant or a cucumber plant, they have these little curls that go around a structure. So those are the tendrils. And in this case, that's what I'm measuring. You're here you can see each color is at different time of day. And you can see here that the movement it's very small, but there's a lot of movement happening in a very small scale. This is a picture of one of the one of the plants that Darwin studied and that I went to look at at the New York Botanical Garden. No, yes, it's a herbarium collection at the New York Botanical Garden. And this plant is it's also a tendril that has attached to a piece of rock, and it's been there for more than Let's do math real quick. 200 years. So this piece of plant has, is, has been attached to this piece of rock for 200 years. And it's so strong that when the person went to collect the plant, to put it in this collection of plants in the herbarium, the plant came in with a rock. And Darwin said in his book that when he was studying this plant, he tried to separate this bond using acid and he couldn't do it. It's a super strong bond. So these plants are not only moving a lot, but they're very strong um, in the way that they attach and they do so. I also think about the way, in the way that I make experiments and I look at um, plants move in different ways, I'm also interested in how we can touch plants. How do we arrive at plants? So in this case, I'm showing you a sculpture of um, a wand or a finger. So I'm thinking instead of, going and grabbing a plant, what if I had this uh, way of first touching a plant, that it has a little, it's a different kind of touch um, connection. I also make shirts that people can use and that I use uh, sometimes 
to find different connections to plants, to find different connections to each other. This is a um, megaphone that I made for the trees. It's a megaphone that's made with mushrooms because mushrooms and trees have this connection on the ground and they already are communicating. So when I found about this, I was surprised because I was like, oh, I've been trying to talk to trees since forever and to plants. And here I find that uh, mushrooms are already doing this connection. So maybe I can learn more about this network and, and join them in that way. And this is my suit for um, doing some what I call like that kind of translations of these movements that I see in plants into a human scale, into the size of a human. Now I'm gonna pass to another question. This question is, what if plants could walk down the streets? And I first asked this question in 2010. Um, in Lima. And Mo told you a little bit about this because this project is called Plantón Móvil. And it starts walking around Lima and seeing some trees and thinking, oh, wow. Like, look at this tree. This tree is being used as a trash can. This tree is completely, look at that state on the tree on the left. It's been cut. The leaves are blackened by smog. Um, and I was thinking if it were me, I would just get up and go. Or at least when I see the bottle or that a cigarette stub that we see on the right coming my way, I would probably dodge it, right? But plants can't do that because they're planted. So that's when I asked, well, what if plants could walk down the streets? What if they could take on the streets like people do when they want to do a protest and say, listen, I want to be heard. I am here. I'm also here, right? Um, I think of plants as neighbors in, our, in the cities. So this is a, a drawing that I made when I first thought of this idea. I made my little plants and I stuck them in a, in a picture. And I thought, okay, I wanna bring a group of plants to interrupt the traffic and interrupt a normal day. Um, and in 2010, I did it, I did the first. So this is a picture of the first plant on mobile. Um, 60 people came. And I didn't know all of them, which was very exciting for me because some of them were my family and my friends, of course, that came because they knew me. But other people came also because they thought they wanted to, uh, they thought they wanted to participate and they thought plants were important and they also wanted to help these plants take on the streets and do their um, peaceful protest. This is the next year, in 2011, um, we did a pro I did the project again and 200 people showed up. So that's more than twice people, twice as much people, twice as many people. You get the idea. Um, so that was a surprise. And then the following year in 2012, around 400 people showed up to Planton Mobile. And this was great. And I was super excited that there were more and more people coming together. And, and people came for very different reasons. Like I said, some people, um, were there because of uh, plants and the importance of plants in a city, because not everyone has access to plants, because in a city like Lima and in many big cities, um, not everyone has access to public parks where we can go and play and where we can go and grow food, where we can go and have clean air, et cetera, et cetera. So, and other people came because of, um, they wanted to be able to have a more ecological city overall. Yeah to have more bikes lanes, to have, um, to talk about deforestation in another place, to, to really uh, talk about a lot of ecological issues. But when there's 400 people in an event, it's hard to know, uh, it was hard to know for me what was happening with everyone in there. So I, was start, I started to think, well, what is the experience that people are, are having? And a lot of the, if you, I don't know if you noticed in the pictures, but um, at the beginning, we used a lot of vehicles. So we had carts, um, supermarket carts and different kinds of vehicles, and we were pushing and pulling plants. But with time, I thought, well, I'm not so interested in, in an event where we are pushing plants. What we're trying to do is move with plants because it is an act of solidarity. We're being solidary, soli solidary with we're expressed, showing solidarity with plants um, by walking together. And together we make this walking forest. And if you think about it, forests are not only made of plants, 
we have insects, we have mammals, we have birds. And so people can be part of that um, forest too. Um, and after we walk with the plants, we plant and we plant in public space. And the idea is that um, the plants either go to a new park that we create or they contribute to a, a park that is already existing but needs a little help. I've done this project in many cities. Um, well, in, in like six cities and they're all very different. And I like showing this picture because the, um, you can see how the planting conditions are gonna be very different. The people, the plants, the parks that we create are very different each time. And it's important that the, the parks that we create um, include plants that are specific to the area. So that if we are in a place like Lima that doesn't have much water, we use plants that are adapted to little water, not plants that need a lot of water, that plants that are gonna thrive and be happy in an environment like Lima. And that is going to create a landscape which is part of um, the ecosystem, the, the place, they're connected to the place. In this case, I'm showing you a planting that took place in Minneapolis. It's, it's one of my favorite plantings because all that area that you see covered with hay, we planted with um, native species. So we planted more than a thousand plants and trees. And all these plants are collecting and filtering the runoff, the water that comes when it rains in Minneapolis, you can see there's highways around it. So it rains a lot and the rain falls on the highway and it picks up all the oils and the um, chemicals that the cars and the um, humans are leaving. Um, so when the, the water picks up all this and then it's dirty and it goes, it continues its path and normally it would go back to the river, but it's giving the river all of these um, toxic materials. So in this case, these plants, what are doing, they're fil helping, helping filter some of these um, chemicals and pollutants that the street gives the water before the water returns to the Mississippi River. Um, plantón móvil is, plantón is a word in Spanish for a sapling, so a tree that is ready to be planted. And it's also the word for um, a sitting. So uh, um, a way of people manifesting and taking, occupying a space to, to manifest a concern or um, voice some of their um, thoughts, preoccupations. Um, and then mobile is, is the, um, the walking part. So this project takes on both the protest and also the planting. And like I said before, when I realized that um, vehicles were not so important for me, but more the idea of walking with, I started doing workshops with people where uh, people of all ages, and I'm showing you here some drawings that are made by children in a school in, in London, where I worked there for three weeks. And we did these collages. So before Planton Mobile, we were thinking, okay, if we had all these plants and then we had these people, if we brought them together, what can we do when we're together? What can I do when I can hear like a fuchsia flower? Or what can I do when my, when my leg is a um, fern leaf? Um, what can we do when we're together? How are we um, better? It's another way of collaborating. And what we do is we build something that I call plant human connectors that are literally that. There are ways of, of connecting a plant, kind of like how I have Teo here um, on my chest. How do I connect my body with a plant body? And if it's in my head, how will it impact my walking when, if it's in, when it's in my head? Or if it's in my leg, how will that change the way that I walk? And in this case, with the children at Willowbrook, what we did is we wove baskets and then we connected those baskets around our bodies with the different kinds of plants. Um, as I said, Plantón Móvil is a project that um, is a way of expressing solidarity and moving with plants um, and helping create green areas in different cities around the world. And it's been happening for 10 years. So every year I do a different Plantón Móvil and every year it's different. And um, I've had adults join, children join, dogs join, uh, grandparents, people of all ages um, come and join with Plantón Móvil and same plants of all species come um, join Plantón Móvil. So 
I haven't done one in Portland yet, and I don't know exactly how that would work, but um, I'm thinking about it, so I'll keep you posted. The last question that I have to share with you is, what if plants could go to space? And that is my latest question. So I was thinking about how um, here on Earth, there's a lot of people who um, are thinking about agriculture and politics in a way that involves having um, monocultures or a single ident a single solution. So for agriculture, they might say, oh, we need corn to look this way, or we need potatoes to look this way because they fit better on the machines that make French fries. And we're only going to grow this single kind of potato or this single kind of corn, um, and we're going to do it massively. And the same, some people believe that um, some people are ideal for some situations or for society. So they want everyone to look and fit in that same way, to think that same way. Um, and that's not necess that's not good, of course, because what we need is diversity. And in, in a garden and in a community, we need that differences to make us stronger, to make us, to help us collaborate, to again, like, like joining with a tree or like asking a plant, how do we conserve water? When we come together, as you know, um, we have more ways of thinking and more ways of doing and more ways of expressing um, everything, even joy, right? Um, so that's what's happening on Earth. And I'm thinking, okay, some people here just want a single one. And I want to talk about diversity. So I said, okay, who expresses diversity really well? And I thought of potatoes. Um, potatoes are Peruvian and there's like 4,000 varieties of potatoes that exist and there's that means that there's big potatoes, small potatoes, medium potatoes, purple, um, yellow, red, uh, stripes, there's all kinds of potatoes, um, 4,000 so I'll stop naming them there but you can imagine the different kinds of potatoes that exist and um, so I was thinking okay great potatoes are going to be my allies for talking about diversity. And then I'm thinking, OK, what's happening in space? Um, a lot of times when people talk about space, they are or some people are talking about how, um, well, you know, it seems to me that they are saying things here on Earth in terms of climate and the climate crisis or climate change, there are a lot of trouble. So we should just start looking for a solution of going elsewhere and we should find a new planet where we can go and do probably exactly the same thing. Like get there, build our houses, drink all the water um, or use all the water, um, contaminate, take from the soil, have an attitude where it's not um, reciprocal. It's not giving and taking, but it's more like taking and taking. So, and also who gets to go there? Very few people will get to, to go to these new countries. So, to these new planets, not countries, to these new planets. So I'm thinking, okay, we need a way of thinking about space exploration that does um, exploration in a different way, does rec that recognizes living forms that we don't know are living forms, that respects um, others, that respects the land, that respects the, the, be the living beings that we find. And that also when we are coming out, to the to other planets, we are expressing um, a message that Earth people or Earth beings are multiple. We're not. We don't only look like Matt Damon. We look like whole. We look. We're purple. We're striped. We're red. We're you know. We're yellow. We're all different kinds of colors. So I'm doing this project with my friend Xin Liu. And Xin is from China, and she was also very happy about. Um, choosing potatoes because a Chinese space agency is planting potatoes in a project they have in the moon. Um, so what we did is we were able to send some potato seeds to space. And what you're seeing here on the left is this, um, the launch of the dragon, it's called the dragon rocket. And um, this went on to the International Space Station 
And in it, there were nine different projects from artists. One of them was our, our, our potato project that we call Unearthing Futures. And on the right, you'll see the image of the potato seeds in this little container. This container here is 1.5 centimeters in diameter. Um, so it's, it's kind of like the size of my nail, my, my thumbnail. It's very small. And the seeds that are in it are they're the size of um, quinoa grain. They're tiny, tiny, or like a big um, speck of sand. And we sent 150 of our potatoes to go to space. And they stayed there for a month. And then they came back on Earth. And they came back to Earth, and we are growing them. So these, I'm showing you the potatoes that went to space. Um, growing in, in my backyard here in Portland. Um, some Half of these potatoes that you're seeing here are potatoes that went to space, and the other half are um, potatoes that stayed on Earth that, um, that are exactly from their, they're like cousins. So there were six families of potatoes that we were working with. And if you imagine the families, in each family it's a group of cousins, and half of the cousins went to the space and half of the cousins stayed on, on, on Earth. And then when they are reunited here on Earth, we grow them together and we see, oh, did the space cousins are doing anything different? Are they growing different? Or do they have different colors? Do they have different shapes? And something that was very important to us is that when the plants grew, that they would produce little potatoes. Because sometimes potato plants grow as a plant and we see the leaves and the stems and they look healthy and beautiful but they don't produce the tubers, the little potatoes underground. And we wanted those tubers, those little potatoes, because those potatoes, instead of being cousins, they're identical twins to the potatoes that went to space. So this way we can have, um, when the plant dies because of its normal cycle of life, um, we can have an identical twin that next year we can plant and still have another space potato again. So I'm very excited because these potato, these plants have produced the tubers. And here you can see two of the, the purple potatoes um, that are growing, that are growing and that are um, here with us. And these were space potatoes. So these are part of the space cousins. And they're tiny. These, these first batch of potatoes, they are really small. Um, and that's part of the normal process. And they will serve as seeds, as I mentioned, for the next um, generation of space potatoes. And here you can see Theo holding uh, one of the potatoes so you can get an idea of how small um, they are. And this question of like, what if plants could go to space? Um, the first way we've answered it with this project is sending these potatoes, actually sending potatoes to space. But then we want to, um, you think with the potatoes about different ways of um, imagining diverse futures, imagining different ways of space, exploring space, different ways of uh, imagining rockets and astronauts and um, alien encounters and alien languages and, and just so that we can, more people or whoever wants to join, what can, um, include their way of imagining the way the, the way we go to space. Um, and I partly say that because I didn't I never imagined um, space. When I was little I didn't think of space and I don't know if it's an individual thing. I still need to ask my friends, but when when I was little being an astronaut was not part of something that I could imagine or, or dream of. So I don't know if it's because I'm a woman. I don't know if it's because I'm Peruvian and there are no Peruvian astronauts um, or space programs. Um, but in any way, this is my opportunity to answer that question, to think, what if now uh, I could have a connection to, to space exploration? So these are my questions, um, my what ifs, and the way that I answer my what ifs um, with my art practice. I think art can be a way of answering these questions and inventing um, objects, experiments, and situations where we can explore these questions. Now, after I said questions like three times in a row, 
I would like to hear from you and see if you have any questions for me. Okay. I have a question from uh, Christina. What do you, Christina Plesa, and I mispronounced your name, I'm sorry, Christina. Uh, what do you enjoy about these projects? Are there challenges that come with these projects? Yes, many. I, I enjoy these projects um, a lot. I, I feel very lucky to be an artist because I, I think um, I have fun doing it. Um, a lot of my work has humor in it. I, I think like putting shoes on trees or, or walking around with trees or, or thinking that I'm gonna send potatoes to space. I'm very serious about <clears throat> these projects, but then I also am, um, I'm thinking of, of ways of, of laughing and having fun. So yes, um, I enjoy exploring, uh, inventing experiments and making objects and kind of being able to, to invent um, realities and answers to my questions um, and to explore those questions. And of course, with that comes challenges. There are a lot of challenges with these projects. Um, with planting, planting is a big challenge, planting in public space because finding the space, finding who's gonna take care of the plants afterwards. Um, something that's important to me is that the, the areas that we plant are plant in, in collaboration with the community so that it's not me saying like, okay, here you go, plants, you have to take care of them. It's a, a joint effort where people um, want to have these plants. Um, there are other challenges in terms of like, time and, and funding sometimes, a lot of times, you know, finding funding to, to make these projects um, and organizing, working with people when you're collaborating, there are a lot of challenges there as well. But I think part of the challenges make, are, are connected with the parts that I enjoy. Because when you overcome the challenge, then you're like, yes, I did it. And, and, and things happen in a way that don't, wouldn't necessarily have happened if you, did it on your own or if it would have been an easy path. So I have another question from Keenan. Keenan asked, what inspired you to be an artist? Ooh, that's a good one, Keenan. I think, um, I don't know. I've, I've known I wanted to be an artist since I was little. I don't know how. I just, one time I said it out loud and then I heard myself and I was like, oh, wow, yeah, I do want to be a painter. I, I thought I wanted to be a painter. And the only time I've doubted it is, is when I thought I could also be a marine biologist. So I want, I've, I've always wanted to be an artist. And, and I think growing up with my grandfather and being in the garden with him and observing everything around us and everyone around us, um, is very part a big part of me becoming a nurse. Okay, I'll keep on going. Um, more questions. Um, <clears throat> Christina says it does look like a lot of. I'm sorry. <coughs> yeah, let's wake up with that cough. It does look like a lot of fun being open and creative, but also seriously looking from a scientific lens. Yes, exactly. Um, I'm hoping I can do both. Oh, thank you, Christina. And then Ziare and Jalen, did I miss, I'm probably mispronouncing, Ziare, Ziare? I think that's correct. Okay. Um, and Jalen both wanted to know how I'm able to get the plants to talk and make noise. This was from a video of your work that they watched. Yes, that animation. My friend Anais Blondet did an, um, an animation of the sculptures that I made. So um, they weren't necessarily talking when we, she, there's a point where we do an interview to the plants, but we didn't want it to, we didn't want to speak for the plants. We didn't want to be like, I'm a plant and I think this, because we were trying actually to listen to the plants. So in the part of the video where we asking the plants, what we are, the sound that comes out of it is recordings of uh, leaves, rough, uh, moving in the wind or um, wood squeaking or some uh, sounds that we recorded from, from actual plants. And then we made them move by taking a picture of a plant, of the sculptures here, of the legs here. And then we took a second picture of the legs here and then a third picture of the legs here. And then when we put them together, you see the legs moving. So that's how we did it. Um, 
Christina's asking if I have a favorite project. Ooh. No, I, I don't, Christina, because I, I sometimes I even go back to my projects. Like Planton Mobile, I've been doing every year for 10 years. Um, sometimes the my Darwin project, I keep doing um, still over time. And sometimes I go back to different um, to projects. And so I like them all and I like having them, um, some of them still open at the same time. Um, Maddie is asking, what kind of things do you like to do for yourself to get ready for art making, for the brainstorming process? Oh, great question. I think it's related to the other question about the favorite project. Uh, for me, um, when I'm able to have a studio space, which is not the case right now, but even if it's a, a desk, I like having different like islands of projects or experiments at the same time. And that helps me think and prepare so that I don't necessarily, I'm not necessarily thinking, okay, I need to solve this problem right now. I'm rather going to think about this idea for a little bit, then I'm gonna think about this idea for a little bit. And then I find that the projects start to cross pollinate and they start to feed on each other and communicate to each other. And, and for me, it's helpful to not um, have the pressure of thinking, okay, you solve this one thing right now. So I can hop on from different ideas and have them feed off each other. Um, I have another question from Marquise. Why do you carry plants and walk down the streets? Excelente pregunta, Marquise. And the answer is, I carry plants because and walk down the streets because I, I think um, the project started in Lima and I started because I saw that the plants were being mistreated and people were doing things, some people were doing things to the plants and they couldn't um, move in a way that they could um, avoid being um, used as trash cans or being um, cut too much or just um, move in a way that people would move to say, hey, not, not me, or move away from the aggression or move away, um, move like people do protest when they take on the streets and they go and walk on the streets and they say, this is not right. I am here. I have a voice. I want to say something. I, I have some rights. So for me, it was a way of giving that uh, plants the opportunity to take on the streets in the same way that people do and say, I am here, I live in the city too. This idea that plants live only in the forest is not necessarily true. Plants live here in the city with us and their neighbors and they um, need some rights. And then also um, with that idea is that plants, um, everyone in the city should have access to public parks to have plants, to be around plants, to grow plants. And in many cities, the distribution, the, the place and the amount of plants is not, um, it's not even. Some people have access to green areas, some people don't have access to green areas. So I wanted to, to work with the plants to say, I am here, I'm a neighbor of this city, look at me. And also let's get together and let's make, um, let's create green areas for everyone to have access to, because having access to green areas is um, has positive impacts for health, for recreation, um, for many many things. Um, that's my answer. Um, Serena is asking, if you weren't doing art with plants, what would you do your art with? Um, so lately, I've been very interested in working with something that some people call biomaterials. And biomaterials means um, materials that are made with uh, ingredients that are, uh, that come from, okay, how do I, the definition for a biomaterial is, it uses ingredients that are uh, safe to, for example, eat, that you could use in a kitchen, so they're more natural and less chemical. And when you create that material, it becomes biodegradable. So it would disintegrate into the ground not, instead of like plastic that can stay a um, hundred years before it dissolves. And then it never dissolves, it just becomes smaller. Or styrofoam that stays 
styrofoam to me it's like the devil of materials because it never disappears it just stays there forever and um, polluting water and soil and um, so when i'm not working with plants i'm trying to learn more how do i make these materials that i make in my kitchen it's another way of bringing science in in um to my close uh, proximity in my kitchen and i mix this make this oh, i was thinking if i could have one um do i have time i can bring one okay we'll be right back I brought two. So this, for example, is a jar. It looks like brown water, and it's actually kombucha tea. So I don't know if you've heard of kombucha tea, but some people drink it, and you can get it in the supermarket. And it grows from this. It grows this layer, which they call the mother, the scoby mother. And that layer is made out of um, bacteria and yeast, yeast is a kind of fungi, and they grow together and they make this material that then becomes, oh, we woke up, right? That then becomes a form of leather that instead of coming from an animal um, is created by these microorganisms. So that's an example of a biomaterial. And then I also made this plastic that is not made out of petroleum, but it's made out of, It's made out of gelatin and starch. So you can see how I can make my sculptures with these materials that look like plastic, but they are not. And they can I can have the same visual effect, but a very, very different environmental impact. <laughs> now, Omi, Naomi and Jalen are asking, where do you get your inspiration? How do you come up with your art ideas? Um, I think um, I think questions bring more questions. So sometimes when I have a question like, "Oh, why does this happen this way? Um, what if I? What if it happened differently?" Then I get another question. Oh. Well, what if it, if it happens this way, what if I had this tool to be able to um, do that differently? Or what if, what if I could do it with someone else? Or what if I could, you know, um, do that standing on my head? So I think just having one question to me brings another question, and which then brings another question. And, and just having that um, flow of questions helps me invent my own answers that become my my art. Gemma is thank you, Gemma. Gemma is complimenting my style, um, and she is asking what inspires my style. Um, I like colors, so. I think my style in the way that I work, there's another good thing about being an artist is um, you get to do the things that you like and you get to put all the things that you like in one place. A lot of times, sometimes you have to exclude some of the things that you like when you're collaborating with others, but, but mostly um, 
I like colors and I like textures and I um, like materials a lot. I like touching things. I, I like my work to, to have a, a, an experience of touch and smell and touch is very important to me. So I think the style of my work comes from that, comes from always having loved colors and materials and textures and, and, and bringing all of those um, together and then having fun, I think also, trying to leave some time for fun in the artwork. I have another question here from Marjan. Um, again, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your names. Um, do you consider the species of the plants based on the climate you want to make your project in? Definitely. So, especially when planting. Um, I started working with native plants because in, in Lima, people were saying, oh, why are you advocating? Why do you want um, green areas in a city that has no water? And my reply was like, well, because we, I don't want a garden or a park that looks like a French garden. I want a garden that looks like, um, the, that includes the plants that would exist here in, um, in, a, in a desert, which exist. Um, so it's very important to me to start working with native plants. Also because when you're planting in areas that don't necessarily have green areas, which is part of the idea, um, that means there are less resources. So there's probably less water, less um, soil or you know, healthy soil or compost. Sometimes we're planting in conditions that are not um, exactly um, ideal or you know, the same conditions that would happen in a, in a rich neighborhood. So it's important to have plants that will thrive in those conditions without stressing the the um, what's what is available the water that's available the soil that's available the resources that exist in the area um, in time i've also included now i only talk um not only about native plants but also plants adapted to the local conditions just so it doesn't become this so i don't fall into this um dichotomy or like this tension between like oh you're a native and you're a, you're an invasive species because a lot of times when um, people talk about invasive species, they're also including species that are not necessarily invasive. They're just not from the area. So they're just migrants like me. So I think it's important to, to, for me to include native species and plants that are adapted. So long, answer, long way to answer that question, Marge. <laughs> um, and then I have one more question. Um, oh no, that's from Margin. Okay. Um, so, well, that's, that's all the time that we have. And I really, really want to thank you for being here. And I can't wait to meet um, all of the Dr. MLK Junior School students. And I especially want to thank the fourth graders from Mrs. Bree's class for all of your questions. I hope I, I got to answer them in a way that you liked, and I hope we get more, uh, more opportunities to talk more and, and I get to hear from you as well. Thank you. Thanks, Lucia, that was great. Yeah, thank, so, you. thank you for a wonderful presentation. And it was really nice to have Teo with you as well. Mm -hmm. um, thanks so much for sharing your time with us this morning. Um, thank you everybody who's joining us via YouTube Live and Zoom. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again the same time next week uh, for Recess, which is a project by uh, Kim Sutherland and Jordan Rosenblum. Um, we will see Lucia again in another few months to learn more about where her practice is going. Maybe we'll see how those potatoes are doing, the space potatoes and their cousins. Um, it's one of my favorite things to hear about. So thank you so much for sharing that part of your work. Um, this is part of the KS Mocha 2021 Visiting Artist and Lecture Series, and we are so honored uh, to share time with you. So to our MLK Junior School students, uh, thanks very much. We'll see you all next week, and everybody have a great day. <laughs>